Welcome to Vanadium. I'm Chris Rankin. The more I learn about this mad world, the more mysterious it seems. I find life is complicated, and so are the characters in it. One of the darkest, most fascinating, and also one of the most tragic stories in science and technology centered around a man whose name is not nearly as well known as it should be. Jack Parsons was one of the most important scientists in the 20th century, the first with the rocket scientist title. Before Parsons, people that fiddled with rockets were looked at like nutcases, blowing off their fingers in their garages. He made rockets a science and helped to shape the entire field of jet propulsion technology. Parsons invented hundreds of rocket fuel formulas, designed engines, and founded the world-renowned Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. He did all of this by the age of 37. Jack Parsons advanced his field more in his short career than most of his colleagues and competitors combined, accomplished it all without a degree in the sciences, with a bad case of dyslexia and more than his fair share of eccentricity. Jack Parsons was a scientist, but lived more like a poet or a madman. He lived in an occult world of magic and spells, all the while working with engineering blueprints and rocket propellant chemical formulations. Parsons once said, only in the irrational and unknown direction can we come to wisdom again. That's quite a way for a rocket scientist to look at the world. He was born Marvel Whiteside Parsons on October 2nd, 1914 in Los Angeles. Marvel, that's a great first name. He was born to parents Ruth Whiteside and Marvel Parsons. They had just moved to California from Massachusetts the previous year. Their son was named after his father, but was known in the household as Jack. The marriage broke up soon after Jack's birth, when Ruth discovered that her husband had been spending a lot of time and money with, shall we say, women of the night. Jack's father returned to Massachusetts after being exposed as an adulterer, with Ruth forbidding him from having any contact with Jack. Ruth's parents, Walter and Carrie Whiteside, moved to California to be with Jack and their daughter, using their wealth to buy a fancy house on Orange Grove Boulevard in Pasadena, known locally as the Millionaire's Mile. They all lived there together, and things were good for a while. Jack was surrounded by the good things, but his childhood was pretty far from perfect. He lived, according to reports, a very lonely, solitary life, and spent much of his time just reading by himself. Jack was really interested in the works of Jules Verne, which brought him deeper into the world of science fiction. This is where Parsons started dreaming of rockets. At age 12, he started junior high school, not the best time for a lot of people. This is where Parsons he started to perform very poorly in school, which some biographers attribute to undiagnosed dyslexia. He was also bullied severely, and back then, being bullied severely was severe. Although unpopular, by all accounts, Parsons managed to form a strong friendship with Edward Foreman, a boy from a poor working class family who lived not far away. Foreman defended Jack from those asshole bullies and also shared his interest in science fiction and rocketry. In 1928, the pair, adopting the Latin motto, per aspera ad astra, or through hardship to the stars, began engaging in homemade gunpowder-based rocket experiments in the nearby Aurora Seco Canyon. They also tested their explosive propellants in the Parsons family back garden, which left it for decades pockmarked with craters. They incorporated commonly available fireworks, such as cherry bombs, into their rockets, and Parsons suggested using glue as a binding agent to increase the rocket fuel's stability. This research became more complex when they began using materials such as aluminum foil to make the gunpowder castable into different shapes. Jack wasn't just reading about chemicals and rockets. He was devouring any book he could get his hands on. This is when his interest went in an unconventional direction. Based on the historical accounts, it's hard to say exactly what first started Jack Parsons down the road of the dark arts. Some have said it was the devil in his ear. Parsons started research into occultism and magic traditions. One night in his bedroom, 
even performed a ritual intended to invoke the devil. Parsons admitted he worried that the invocation had been successful, and for a while, he was scared off of the occult activities. In 1929, he started John Muir High School, where he maintained his close, insular friendship with Edward Foreman, but didn't take the curriculum very seriously. After he received failing grades his first semester, Parsons' mom sent him away to study at the Brown Military Academy for Boys, a private boarding school near San Diego. Jack Parsons didn't really love it there, and was quickly expelled for setting off explosions and destroying the dormitory toilets. The Parsons family wasn't sure how to handle Jack, and spent several months touring Europe before finally returning to Pasadena. Jack Parsons began studying at the privately run university school, which took an unconventional approach to teaching. He finally flourished academically, becoming editor of the school newspaper and winning an award for literary excellence. Teachers who had trained at the nearby California Institute of Technology honed his attention on the study of chemistry. This is where things began to take a dark turn in Jack's family, unfortunately. With the onset of the Great Depression, their fortune began to dwindle. And in July 1931, Jack's grandfather Walter died. With the family's financial difficulties deepening, Parsons began working on weekends and school holidays at the Hercules Powder Company, where he learned even more about explosives and how he might use them in his rockets. He reunited with his friend, Edward Foreman. They continued to explore the subject in their spare time, building and testing different rockets, sometimes with materials Parsons had stolen from his work. Parsons soon constructed his first solid fuel rocket engine and corresponded with pioneer rocket engineers, including Robert Goddard, Hermann Oberth, and the great Werner von Braun. Parsons and Von Braun had hours of telephone conversations about rocketry during this time. Parsons graduated from university school in 1933 and enrolled in Pasadena Junior College with the hope of earning an associate degree in physics and chemistry. But he dropped out after one term because of his financial situation. Then he took up permanent employment at the Hercules Powder Company. His employers then sent him to work at their manufacturing plant in Hercules, California, far away in the San Francisco Bay, where he earned a relatively high monthly wage of about $100. Although it wasn't a great life, the work was interesting, but it was hard on him. He was away from his only friend and colleague, and also plagued by headaches caused by exposure to nitroglycerin. It was only a few years before it was invented by Albert Hoffman, but LSD would have cured those headaches. Parsons worked to save enough money to continue his academic studies. He began a degree in chemistry at Stanford University, but after a while just couldn't afford the living expenses and tuition. He eventually returned to Pasadena. It was another setback, another failed launch. He hadn't lifted off, but Jack Parsons hadn't given up either. It was a magical time for science and for California. Dreams seemed within reach even for outsiders with nothing to their name. Glittering success was sitting just over the next mountain, but for Parsons, and for most, a cloud of darkness isn't far behind. In hopes of gaining access to state-of-the-art Caltech resources for their rocketry research, Parsons and Foreman attended a lecture on rocket-powered aircraft at the university. They approached PhD student Frank Molina a mathematician and mechanical engineer. Molina was writing a thesis on rocket propulsion, and he shared their interests. The three discussed designing a liquid fuel rocket motor. Parsons' group was growing. Parsons, Foreman, and Molina applied for funding from Caltech together. However, they didn't mention their ultimate objective was to develop rockets for space exploration. At that time, Science was much more near-term and practically focused. The scientific establishment didn't want to hear Jules Verne fantasies about satellites and space exploration. The authorities thought that was just comic book stuff. Caltech's Clark Blanchard Milliken immediately rejected their application. But Molina's doctoral advisor, Theodore von Karman, saw more promise in their proposal and agreed to it 
allowing them to operate in the university's Guggenheim Aeronautical Laboratory. They named themselves the Galset Rocket Research Group. The trio focused their distinct complementary skills on collaborative rocket development. Parsons was the chemist, Foreman the machinist, and Molina the theorist, the numbers guy. Molina wrote in 1968 that Parsons lacked the discipline of a formal higher education, but had an uninhibited and fruitful imagination. Parsons and Foreman were eager to improvise and shoot from the hip, contrasting with Molina, who insisted on a more disciplined scientific approach. Parsons and Foreman's drive and creativity kept Molina focused on building actual rocket engines and not just solving equations on paper. The three shared socialist political values, operating on what they called an egalitarian basis. Molina taught the others about scientific procedure and they taught him about the practical elements of engineering and rocketry. They often hung out after hours, smoking marijuana and drinking. Molina and Parsons were also writing a semi-autobiographical science fiction screenplay they planned to pitch to Hollywood. So much of a successful career is about the partnerships and relationships. Everyone needs someone to believe in them, to share the vision. Jack Parsons finally had his dream team. This is where things take off. But with rockets and with life, the tricky part is getting the ship to hold together. Remember that night in Jack's bedroom when he thought he conjured the devil? The future shows that maybe he was right. Thank you very much. This is Chris Rankin with Vanadium, and this episode is To Be Continued.